Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Broderson. And as always, for a mastermind group, I'm here with Tobias Carlyle and Hari Ramachandra. So, gents, how are you today? I'm really well. Good to see you, Harry. Good to see you, Stig. Yeah, happy New Year to you guys and to everyone listening to the show. So um, before we uh, we kick this off with the uh, with the discussion, I, I just wanted to to kick this episode off with a short story, and and let's just call that story uh, advice of the day. So um, the advice is uh, do not catch a falling knife. And so I know what you might be thinking, like uh, which horrible stock did Stig invest in since the last mastermind meeting? I actually haven't really bought any in real stock since, um, but. I did catch a falling knife and it was absolutely brutal. So I was I was cooking with my wife and like chopping up onions. And for whatever reason, I dropped the knife on the floor. And it was just a pure reflex. I I caught it. So I don't know if that was good or bad news, but you know, I have good reflexes apparently. But the bad news is that, well, I, I did catch a falling knife and I cut into my ring finger and it got infected. So I'm coming off like an antibiotic treatment here over the last five days. So Going into this meeting, I wanted to say the advice of the day is do not catch a falling knife. It's very, very painful. So with that said, Toby, I want to kick it over to you because your pick is a great candidate. It's a, and it, it's not a falling knife. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident <laughs> saying so. So uh, why don't we start with you, Toby? You got those crazy cat-like reflexes, Stig. Right. You didn't even think. Right. You just grabbed it out of the air. It's all that spy training uh. or whatever you did, James Bond. Stuff. Exactly, but, you know, it, not like in the movies because it actually hurt a lot. Uh, Jason in this Bourne. case, yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, my pick today is William Sonoma. They're the um, home furnishings retailer. Uh, they have a variety of brands besides William Sonoma. So, you know, they're uh, West Elm, which is for the thirty-somethings, and Pottery Barn, Pottery Barn Kids. They started out. Um, selling was started up by chuck williams in california in in 1956 in sonoma hence williams sonoma and uh, he, he was a big fan of food and cooking and wanted to import and sell french cookware in the states and so i think i just was just doing a little bit of uh scuttlebutt beforehand had a quick chat to my wife about what she thought william sonoma was and in her mind it's still basically a French cookware kitchen kind of retailer, but they do have uh, an expanded offering that includes furniture and tabletops and bars, outdoor furniture and so on. The um, the pandemic uh, forced them to close some stores. So they focused on their uh, digital channel when that happened. And that has more than made up for the losses from those stores. So they're, they're doing very well under these conditions. And it's probably they become more of a of a uh, online retailer increasingly as we as we move forward. They've had this incredibly consistent growth um, at a top line basis for years and years, and they run exceptionally well. They've got this great alignment between uh, return on invested capital and executive compensation, which is one of the things that I really like to see. Um, they're trading reasonably cheaply at the moment. Uh, EV EBIT is under nine, EV EBIT does under eight. And P ratio to the extent that anybody looks at that, thinks about that anymore, uh, 11-ish. So I think it's a fairly modest sort of um, multiple that you're paying for this thing. And then return on invested capital is about 20%, which is just, you know, which is great 13 percent is the average for the s p 500 so it's that's a material uh improvement over the s p 500 and it's been incredibly consistent for years and years and years so i don't i don't have any um you know i like these simple picks that have just got great balance sheets um great cash flow generation great margins and uh where there's alignment with the uh with the the managers and so it, this is like the the you know like my lockheed martin pick from last time they're just they're reasonably safe reasonably consistent good cash flow generation great alignment with the uh with the executive team so that's sort of 
that's my uh, that's my my pick in, in in really simple terms. I'm ready for you guys to beat it up now. I I definitely don't want to beat it up, uh, and, and I can already say that I need to ask you forgiveness whenever you hear what my what my pick is, Toby. So <laughs> I better I better make good friends with you. I I absolutely love this pick, and it's a very it's very Toby type of pick. I also thought about like the Lockheed Martin that you talked about last time. Like all the numbers check out. It's reasonably priced. You know, we should also keep in mind that when whenever it's priced at call it 10 times free cash flow or whatnot, it's like you're also seeing free cash flow doubling. But like th there are some things that to me didn't really make a lot of sense in a way, uh, but in a good way, if I can put it like that. Whenever I seen how much it's it's grown, um uh before the pandemic and until and now, like so much more now comes from e-commerce, which is of course not completely surprising given, given what, what happened, but we're talking about like 70% of revenue uh, now. Um, I saw uh, expansion on, on, on gross profit, always fantastic to see. Uh, but for, and for this type of industry, I was a bit surprised. Uh, whenever I, I dig a bit more into the numbers, um, like the networking capital, more or less the same. Uh, good to see uh, capex more or less the same, and not just from the last past year, but over the last eight years. Plus, you know, uh, the operating cash flow have gone from call it five hundred and twenty eighteen, five hundred and eighty six, twenty nineteen, and and training twelve months is like thirteen hundred. So I'm like, it looks absolutely amazing. Um, I I don't really have any kind of Major concerns. I probably probably should have. Let me let me throw it over to you, Hari. What's your what's your take on the pick? No, as you no, said, Steg, I think interesting pick, Toby, and the classic Toby pick. <laughs> uh, the question I I have though is Toby, uh, how do you see this? Is it something that you think of as a long term buy and hold, or is it a value play wherein you're you think it is? Uh, selling at a discount right now, and then you're going to uh, sell out of it in a year or two. Yeah, so I I always try to find things where there's basically there's two ways for the pick to work out. You can either, you, you generate pretty good returns by holding onto it just because the, the assumptions embedded in the stock price are sufficiently low that whatever happens um, to the business, you're still going to do sort of fairly well but then there's also this possibility if the business does quite well then um you know it, i think it i think it's i think it's trading cheaply for something that is reasonably high quality i'm guessing that the reason is that they've had this quite substantial ramp over the last year or so and uh the market is just having to digest a little bit the, the bigger size and I've, I, it's come back uh, a little bit over the last six months or so and i'm I'm guessing that if you look at it sort of on its historical metrics, it's looking expensive on its historical valuation ratios or its its, it's price multiples because um, it's been cheap for quite a long. I think it's been a reasonably good value for a reasonably long period of time, and it's been quite a good business through that through that time. So I think that either you get that mean reversion probably closer to where it's worth, which you know it might be it might be worth thirty to fifty percent more. Than here, or you just clip the coupon, keep the get the tickets on the way through, where it's got a pretty good yield, and the business should continue to grow. I guess the question is, if we sort of normalise and we go back to a world where folks aren't shopping online as much, will it hurt them to have shut down those stores? I sort of feel like that was the trend anyway before the pandemic. There was a shift to to online. There's other other companies have made that shift successfully, Target and so on. Um, Best Buy. Lots of those companies have have the retailers were struggling well before the pandemic, and uh, the pandemic only accelerated that sort of. There were, there were there were there's a big differential between the winners and the losers. There are some who figured out how to get online, and there were some who just couldn't do it. And the ones who couldn't do it have essentially gone away, and the ones who figured it out have recovered and and done quite well. And I put William Sonoma in that latter category that. And the market has recognized and so you can see there's been a very good run on the stock price from my perspective i don't really care what the stock price has done historically i'm only looking at it on its current figures 
and what I think it can do in the future. I think it'll muddle along and I think it'll generate reasonably good returns. Um, if they can sustain this return on invested capital and uh, and I think that they're, they're incentivized to do so because they do have that tight alignment between return on invested capital and executive compensation, which is one of my favorite things to see. So they'll continue to generate that super normal return on invested capital. And it's a, it's a, it's still a great brand. Everybody, it's a very popular brand here. Williamson, I asked my wife if we were to get rid of our furniture and rebuy, would, would we go and look at Williams Sonoma is like a lot of the standard stuff that you would buy for the house would be automatically bought from there. So it's still front of mind for for folks like us. So I I I think it's I don't think it's a uh, I don't think it's a pick that'll make you rich, but I think that it's a pick that will keep you rich. And it's kind of that's the sort of stuff that I look for these days. Yeah, I'm also curious um, how are they affected by all the supply chain issues and their business model essentially is going through a transformation in the sense that, as you said, there were more brick and mortar stores. Now they're two thirds of their sales, I believe came from online. So now they're on the same uh, playing field as say Amazon's of the world. So do you see any risks there? And do you see any uh, advantages they have over somebody like Amazon or other Wayfair and other online retailers? Yeah, that's, that's a, that's a, an existential risk. I guess it hasn't, it hasn't happened yet. I still think that if you're looking for a particular level of quality, it would still be Williams Sonoma as the first stop for that. But there's always a risk that Amazon or somebody enters that space with maybe a, Amazon hosts a different a slightly different brand maybe starts um, pushing that quite hard. Um, I still think that, that the size of the goods makes it um, difficult to enter into that that way. I, I think that William Sonoma has an advantage uh, in uh, both occupying the, the mind share and in and in physical distribution of those things for the moment. But you're right that that's a that's a that's a risk. And, and as I to the supply say, chain, was... sorry, sorry, so I was just going to say as to the supply chain issue, I think that's that's that that is impacting them, but I don't think that it's not unique to them. So it's not a a risk that I think is specific to them. No, I I don't think that's the that's the specific to them either. Um, I pulled up here that sixty five percent of the company's selections are imported from Asia and and Europe. Um, so so I, I'm sure they have the they have their own issues, and that's also one of the reasons why I'm just so surprised whenever you track the gross margins and the operating profits. Uh, trailing 12 months, you have 43% uh, and 16.6 correspond uh, correspondingly. And I'm like, how is that possible for that type of, of business? Uh, why is Amazon not eating the lunch? And it, this is probably my my lack of understanding of the business. When, whenever I thought about it, um, or whenever you, you send an email, like that's what you're going to talk about, I was thinking, well, we're going to talk about an, an, another Beth Beth Beyond uh, until I, I I pulled up um, like the numbers. I mean, what's what's not to like about it? With all that free cash flow they're doing, small yield, uh, dividend yield, and like buying back shares and decent chunks um, seems to be very well managed from a capital allocation basis. Um, I really wish I had something not as nice to uh, to say about it, but I but I really don't. And so, so whenever you look at something like this, uh, Toby and um, Harry alluded at it before in terms of like how um, how you would hold it, is this in the um, sort of like a, in a basket approach? Like you would have a lot of these type with a P of call it ten or free cash flow of 10, 12, you would then hold um, and then take from there, like and then automatically replaced. Is that sort of like how you're seeing this? Yeah. I uh, you know, my approach is to to construct portfolios rather than to uh, worry too much about any individual company. So that's that's worth pointing out. the 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 ETF that I run, the Zig, the Acquirers Fund, holds uh, Williams Sonoma. It's a recent acquisition for for Zig. Uh, and Zig, when when whenever I do a morning, you can go to Morningstar and you can pull up the Zig page, and you can have a look at the criteria. The sort of the factors that Zig tracks most closely to, and Zig always tracks very close. Zig is the the, the little um, 
the little button is always way down for value. So it's in it's it's firmly value rather than growth. And you'd you'd expect that knowing me. And then the quality number is always like right up at the top for quality versus junk. And that's um that's the, just the way that I that those are the two uh, approaches that I take. You know, when when we wrote quantitative value, which came out in 2012. Um, we used a lot of these factors, or not not factors, rather. We used a lot of these analyses that I regarded and Wes regarded as um, as value, you know, fundamental analysis of a balance sheet, fundamental analysis of a business, and, and cash flow conversion, all those sort of things. Um, in 2013, AQR wrote a paper called Quality Minus Junk, where they took a whole lot of those factors and they decided they were quality factors rather than value factors, which is that's 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 fine. So I've always I've always said it's hard to separate out quality from value, in my opinion. I don't think that anything that's too junky can be too high, can, can be can be value, unless your value definition of value is quite literally like a a, a low price to book, which is the value factor. So I, I'm always trying to maximize. I think of it as just trying to maximize. We're trying to buy the fattest gross margins, the best balance sheet, the best cash flows for as little as we possibly can. It's just that the world now defines some of those things as quality and some of those things as value, but they're in my mind, it's still, it's still value. And I think if you, you know, if you look, I, I've obviously I'm a, I'm a big fan of Buffett's and I've tried to, um, you know, mimic what Buffett does in his approach, which is essentially as, as I've just described. And so it's no, it's no surprise then that that's what the portfolio looks like. It's always going to be reasonably good, uh, value for, uh, for a, pretty good company that's that's sort of how i'm trying to put it together and toby that's when you were talking about buffett i was looking at their market cap it is 11 billion dollars surprisingly small run yeah and it might be a good um addition for berkshire's portfolio uh, of wholly owned companies <laughs> and there is a lot of synergy between them and the rest of the furniture and uh like you know cookware business that berkshire already has yeah, I don't want to let it go just yet. It's at 150 bucks. I think you know, at 260 maybe. Uh, you know that that's about that's about 50 percent plus higher. I think that's the kind of number that you'd want to get for something like this. So I don't. I I, I think that where it is now, there's a lot of there's a pretty fat margin of safety in this. There's a margin of safety in the business, in the balance sheet, in the price. I don't think that. You know, it's not going to 10x from here in the short term, but if you hold it for long enough and it muddles through, I think it's going to, you know, do a sort of mid-teens number for five or ten years, which is kind of the, which is kind of my bogey. Well, I I think that's a good segue, perhaps, Toby, uh, to my pick because that's also not going to do 10x uh, <laughs> anytime <laughs> soon. Um, so. Um, let me let me see if I can ease into this. Um, I might be insulting the value investing community, the Bitcoin community, and the gold community with my pick. So just hit me up on email <laughs> if I forget to insult anyone uh, <laughs> as I'm going through this. You'll insult them personally. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't think it will, it will uh, go as far as that. But um, it's it's really official. You know, I I'm really happy we started with Toby bringing up a traditional value investing pick because my pick is, is not a traditional value investing pick. Uh, my pick for today is gold. And for those of you who have listened to the podcast for years and know how we have discussed Warren Buffett and talked about gold in the past, um, you know, we've traditionally always thought about this as a, as a terrible investment. Uh, right now, we are sort of uh, we doing the classic episodes where we're looking back at some of the things we've said and and some of the books we read in the past. And, and one book we read in back in 2015 was about um, um, what was Tony Robbins' book, Money Master the Game, and how he talked to Red Dalio and about investing in gold. And I listened to this actually yesterday uh, by by coincidence, and I heard myself saying, "It's stupid to buy gold. Why would anyone <laughs> do that?" So here I am a few days later and say. Well, why don't not invest in gold? So, so what's the uh, what's the chain of pace here? So, uh, I had the pleasure of reading Redelius' book, uh, "The Changing World Order," uh, which is just a fabulous book. And um, 
one of the reasons why I really um, like it is because he takes so many lessons from history that I think we can learn from here today. Because it really makes you humble to think of the big cycles and how we as investors are ignorant to it because uh, this time is not different. Uh, it's actually the same cycles we see over and over again, but these cycles are just 50 to 75 years. Uh, some cycles go even longer than that. So we don't have too much experience you know, uh, with them. We might think back at what happened in 2020. We might think back at uh, what happened during the great financial crisis or the dot-com. Uh, so uh, that's not how Redalio is looking at it. And um, I, I found it was really fascinating how we talked about how many times we've changed the monetary system. Uh, actually, if we go back just to the 40s, you know, we had three different monetary systems. And uh, we tend to think that everyone, everything would stay the same, and we're surprised whenever it's not the case. So um, it changed in 1944 with Bretton Woods. Uh, you can think of this uh, simplistically as from one type of gold standard to another. Uh, then it changed again in 1971, whenever the, Nixon took uh, the world off, off the gold standard. And um, the changes typically takes from a few months up to a few years, um, depending on how fast uh, governments react. Um, but everyone is always surprised whenever it happens. So you have this cycle where you have three types of, uh, of money. You have type one, that's uh, hard money. So you can think of this as metal coins if you want, or gold. Uh, we, then we have uh, type two, um, claims on hard money. Um, like say, for instance, banknotes. Uh, that's what we, what we have before 1971, where you could actually convert it to gold. Uh, at a fixed price. Uh, and um, then it transitioned into fiat money. That system blows up. And then we go back to, to hot money again. And uh, one thing that I, um, one stat that really resonated with me was that since, since uh, the year 1700, we had roughly 750 currencies, but only 20% of them remain today. And they've all been significantly devalued. And um, you know, the U.S. dollar would be would be one example. Uh, not that it's from 1700, uh, but but uh, just as one example, it's been significantly devalued since. So, um, why does this happen, and will it happen again? That's the rhetorical question I'm going to to ask. Um, so, I don't believe that world's governments are uh, evil, uh, or at least most are are not. Uh, but I do believe that governments react to incentives. And so what do you do in a democracy if you want to be elected or let's even say that you're a, a dictator and you want to stay in power? Well, um, first you would probably spend money direct, directly to increase your popularity. Um, and you can do that by you know, lowering taxes or subsidizing the population one way or the other. Uh, balancing the budget means that you would basically have to do something that's unpopular. Um, and um, doing something that's unpopular short term is not a good strategy to be in power. So you have politicians and institutions uh, that have an incentive to print money. And we've seen this in all countries uh, and what Redelli refers to as, as empires uh, that leads to this circle of hot money, claims on hot money, and then fiat currency, and then it starts all over. Uh, because these fiat currencies eventually blow up. Um, so if we just take the U.S., we might be a, be a reference point here. Um, it's not a left and right thing. I know it's very often made out to that. Um, I can, If we look at the numbers, the last four administrations have all run significant deficits. Uh, two left, two right, if I might add. And uh, that was just the last time since the budget balanced. Um, the U.S. hasn't been debt-free since uh, 18... Uh, 35. Uh, that was the time that the president was Andrew Jackson, you know, the guy you have on the $20 bill. And so this is not me saying that democracy isn't great. Uh, like Churchill said, democracy is the, is the worst form of government, except for all the others that have been tried. So I want to go into this by saying the democracy is precious and it's one of the most important things we have, but it also has flaws uh, the way it's set up today. And the monetary system has and have worldwide suffered from politicians wanting to be elected or, or re-elected. Um, so, um, 
So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm not saying that we will see a reset of the monetary system anytime soon. What I am saying is that uh, it will eventually happen. I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow or 10 years or 50 years. I don't think necessarily it's going to take 50 years. I definitely don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. But it will it will eventually happen. It always have been. Um, just look at look at the past 80 years and, and what has happened uh, since then. So whenever we do have this quote unquote reset, does it mean that we're going to go back in the gold standard? I don't necessarily think it will. I mean, it is one of many possibilities that it will, but I don't necessarily uh, say that's the case. That's not my reason for investing in gold. So I spoke with uh, with my friend David Stein here the other day. Um, we had him on the show, episode 216 and 384. He's the host of Money for the Rest of Us. And he digged a bit into the different asset classes and how they're done during inflationary periods. And um, one thing I probably should preface this is saying that uh, we do see inflation just, um, we're just coming off like a 7% print here. Um, and I also want to say that uh, we've experienced twice uh, over the past uh, century um, to have two consecutive years where there was a double digit uh, de deficit. Uh, well, I should actually say three times. The first one was during World War One. next one was World War Two, and then uh, now, um, so and just from September 19 to September 21, um, we've added $6 trillion in M2 money supply or close to 25% of the US economy. So uh, what, uh, what he's been looking at, what this research paper shows is that if we look back to 1926, uh, we had eight different inflationary regimes taking up around 19% of the time. And uh, the finding was, quite interesting. If we look at equities in those inflationary times, and um, equities had a negative real return of minus 7%, and a 10% real return whenever it was not. Uh, over the time period, the real return was 7%. Commodities, on the other hand, netted 41% in times of inflation, um, and but minus 1% in non-inflation. Um, and if you look at it, uh, just across, it's 3% real return. So I'm not saying that you should not hold equities. That's not my my point of saying this at all. Uh, and I'm not saying that the the day the markets are today, that's necessarily 7% real, uh, negative real return. Uh, personally, just so you know where I'm coming from, I hold two thirds of my investable portfolio right now in equities, even though I do plan to uh, perhaps change some of that a bit. Uh, but I do think it is prudent to diversify into other asset classes um, because whenever we do see a reset, whenever we we do see this pattern emerge once again, um, it might make make sense to have something of a of a harder currency. Um, so I wanted to I wanted to talk a bit about like my own own experience buying gold, but before we do that, because I do feel I talked a bit too long here, I want to throw it over to. Hari and Toby, if you have any thoughts uh, about gold as an investment. Is that, I guess the, the question is really, and I, 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 you tell me if you want to answer this now at the end, Stig, but I, I have three questions. One of them is, how do you hold it? Are you going to hold through an ETF or are you going to actually go and buy the, the, the ingots or whatever and stick them in a safe? Because the, I, I, I would feel it is, so I, I, I've seen this argument a few times that, you know, Bitcoin is digital gold, and so Bitcoin is taking some of um, the attention away from gold, which is why people have been, which is why gold sort of hasn't really done much in the in the in the near term in the last whatever it is ten or ten or so years. And and I I always thought it was a funny thing because it, there are circumstances where Bitcoin won't work and 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 gold will. So if you get like an electromagnetic pulse or something like that, or we get a big solar flare and it knocks out all of the um the computers and the communication systems bitcoin's not going to be very helpful in that scenario whereas you know physical gold in your safe may be particularly helpful in that scenario so i guess gold is like a gold is a little bit like my argument for william sonoma it's like it's not really going to make you rich but probably keep you rich over a very long term because you've got no counterparty risk and an electromagnetic pulse isn't going to take it out but then if you're not thinking about it in those kind of you know catastrophical I don't know if that's a word or not, but that, you know, if it's not like a catastrophic thing and the other, the other idea is you just, 
you know, it's like an investment play and you, you think it's cheap and you think it could run up in the short term, then I wonder if you, you know, why not then execute it through equities, which, you know, gold miners, I've said this a few times that I look, I, I think the gold miners look pretty good at the moment. I hold some gold miners because they, they've all got religion because they haven't been able to raise any capital. So they've got capital allocation under control. They've been quite profitable over the last five or so years, even with the gold price doing nothing. And it, that if you're in the equities, you get a little bit more leverage against movements in gold. So if gold runs up, the equities tend to run up even more. So that, that I guess that's like three questions there. I don't know if you want to answer them now or, or punt until the end. Yeah, so um, Toby, I'll, I'll be happy to answer those questions. Just make sure to reel me back in if I go <laughs> to a tangent. So um, again, uh, perhaps a bit more, a bit too uh, inspired by uh, by the changing world order. This amazing book by Redalio. Um, I, I do think that there's something about having it uh, simply due to we had stock exchanges being closed for periods of time. We've seen the financial system freeze uh, time and just recently as in the great financial crisis, actually. But um, it is something that I think about, and I, I do see why it's a more leveraged bet. I don't think there's anything wrong with buying gold miners. Like even Berkshire Hathaway did uh, back Barracks Gold back in Q2, 20, uh, I want to say it's 2020 or so, whatnot. But uh, if you- Just a little ago, bit, right? They only had a, they had a very small position. They seemed to sell it really small. quickly. So it was maybe- Yeah, it's only held for a quarter or two. Uh, I do want to say for the record, though, uh, now that we do uh, mention uh, Berkshire Hathaway and, and uh, Warren Buffett, um, as much as Warren Buffett has talked about gold, uh, you know, he, he did used to own a, a third of all mine silver. Um, I think it was back in the late 90s. Uh, so <laughs> he, saw, uh, he saw a case there. Um, and just a, as a side note to that, it wasn't disclosed in the uh, – it, it wasn't required to be disclosed actually in the findings because it was too small of a position compared to to what else they were invested in. So, anyways, even Warren Buffett can see a uh, reason to invest in in that. Um, so, to answer uh, your questions, and um, so if, if we look back at um, uh, 1900, uh, I don't want to give everyone a history lesson as I'm saying this, but I can hear it almost sounds like that. Imagine that you invested your um, ten percent of your portfolio in in ten different stock indexes, so hundred percent total in the ten most promising countries to be the future empire. Um, you would be invested in probably Russia, Germany, Japan, uh, like but seven out of ten of those. Uh, countries, they all the equity markets all blew up like completely, not just close, but like blew up zero value. Um, three three countries uh, uh, went went through that period um, and um, un, unskated, but with a devalued currency. There was the U.S., there was U.K. and Australia. And so, whenever we talk about well, what has the S and P five hundred done, or real returns of seven percent, or whatever it is, there's a survivor bias there. It's just very important to keep in mind whenever we use US data as this is what's going to happen. It's like, no, this is what happened in the most powerful and prosperous country where things went well. That's not what happened to the rest of the world. Um, which again is not my way of saying not holding equity. Uh, I guess I'm just um I think if you ask me whenever we started this uh the podcast, I'd probably say hundred percent equity, that's completely fine. Today I do think slightly different about this. Uh the vast majority in equity, yes, but not not all of it. Um, so I don't, I, I'm, I'm not completely sure if I answer your question. I think you had one more, which was, um, uh, like ETF also. I think that goes back to, um, the thing about gold miners also. It's just a simple question of have something that is, um, that is cut off for the financial system. And it's, it's not a lot. I just want to uh, say for the record, that's not where I would put 20% of my portfolio or whatnot. That's not my, uh, my point of all. Um, another thing is also that, um, if we do see monetary, oh, sorry, uh, Harry, I, I'm ranting here, Harry, <laughs> <laughs> to you. Uh, Stig, I think, uh, this were great points. So is it fair to summarize your argument that you are looking at gold as an insurance against yes. tail risk rather than as an investment and hence the position sizing? Yes. 
uh, and I think you bring up a, a great point, Hari, because one of the criticism, and I, I, I was beating that drum for many years, and I guess I still am, is saying that gold is not an investment. I, I can't discount the cash flows. And it's, it's true, because after 10 years, you would still just have that break of gold, whatever it is. Gold is money. It's not an investment. So yes, it's, it's not going to do 10x unless we see some sort of a gold standard again anytime soon. That's not the point. It's a, it's a worst case scenario basket insurance. Um, yeah, so, so thank you for pointing that out. I should probably have left with that, uh, Hari. No, I think that's a good point, Stig. But one concern I have with gold is that it's like um, you win the game, but they change the rules. And then you don't win. And that's what happened in, I believe, 1930s when they confiscated all the gold. So you might do everything to protect yourself only to find out that the government just takes it away. So is it really a insurance against jail risk is, is one question that I would like you to address. Yes, uh, fantastic question. So uh, Roosevelt uh, confiscated gold in 1933 and it actually took decades for, um, you know, before it was like set completely free and also for commercial banks and even the regulations we have today for how that's calculated on the balance sheet isn't really attractive uh, for banks to to hold. Um, so it also really comes back to how are you are you going to store it? Uh, we've had a few people uh, on the show here talking about gold and they always talk about like, don't, you know, put it in the bank's vault. And the, the way the listation is, it could be confiscated. Um, typically, they would say Switzerland or Singapore, uh, due to the for historical reasons and 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 due to the independence of the countries, then you have other people who would say uh, dig a hole in the ground or like put it somewhere where no one is going to uh, to find it. And it is also something that I had to uh, had to think about, uh, which I also think was one of uh, Toby's questions. Uh, where like, how, how would I store it? Like it's not going to be like ETF. You know, it's easy to store. It's all digital. But then if you cut off for the financial system, it's slightly different. So, um, so, so actually, let me try and answer another question. Question first, in, in terms of uh, gold's role, uh, if we do see a reset, is this going to be a gold standard? I, I don't think it's going to be necessarily the case, even though it is one of many possibilities. I definitely do not think it's going to be a Bitcoin standard, which is sort of like a a, a different topic. I'll be happy to to go into it if if we have time. Um, but uh, would it make sense? Uh, I think some people would argue why it would make sense to go to some sort of uh, gold standard uh, again, because we had that before. If you see who hold the gold today, um, you could also see that, say, those countries probably would be would like that better because they actually do own it and they feel like probably have a better understanding of it than something like a like a cryptocurrency. Uh, one thing to to keep in mind is that. Um, um, and let me just give you some numbers. So, so the U.S. has disclosed around eight eight thousand tons of uh, of gold, uh, with slightly more in Europe, but like it's it's um, spread across many different countries. It's primarily in in Germany, uh, France, and Italy. Hey, I am so excited about this sponsor that we have. The name of the company is Fold. They have a Visa debit card, and here's the card right here. I use this thing literally every single day. Um, every time I swipe it, I get at least 1% back in, in rewards and the rewards are in Bitcoin. And, um, some of the rewards go as high as hundred percent. There's even a full Bitcoin that you can win. After you swipe the card, you spin this little wheel on their app and then it produces the uh, reward, but the lowest uh, reward you'll get is a 1% uh, reward. The thing I really like about this card is, um, you can also on their app buy, uh, gift cards. And so Amazon is one of the partners that they have, and you can go out and buy an Amazon gift card and you get 5% back when you use this card. And so like all your Christmas shopping or whatever it might be that you're doing on Amazon, you're getting 5% back. It's all paid to you in Bitcoin rewards. You can withdraw those Bitcoin rewards to a self custody wallet, whatever you want to do with it. There's no gimmicks. There's nothing that you're not seeing up front. Um, it's just an amazing uh, company, an amazing platform. And every single swipe, I'm getting Bitcoin, so I love it. Um, if you want to sign up for this thing, and I'm telling you, this thing is this thing is a no-brainer. Uh, go to foldapp.com/tip. That's foldapp.com/tip. You'll get 20% off uh, their Spin Plus annual fee. 
uh, when you sign up uh, with that link. So go to foldapp.com slash TA. Um, no one really knows how much gold China has, except for, I guess, China. Uh, but they are the biggest producer of, of gold themselves. And the, the government is buying all of that. And they're buying all that they can find uh, other than that. So they probably have the second biggest uh, portion of gold next after the U.S., and there might be a there might be a a higher understanding of in in the population in terms of what is held privately than perhaps in the states if you know what hits the hits the fan. But regardless, I, if we do see this uh, this reset, I don't know if it's going to happen. Again, it's a it's a worst case scenario type of thing. Uh, but if money or when money is going to be hot, whenever that's going to be, I do see gold as one of of many. Uh, potential uh, scenarios. So uh, what to do in terms of storage? Um, I definitely don't believe that I would have in my own home and I, I don't. And it's also, it's a very small amount. So, you know, please don't come for me. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I do have it uh, placed safely somewhere else. We also have different relations. I'm, I'm based in Denmark, as some of you might know. So we have different relations here. And uh, even if you, if you put it in a vault in the Danish bank, they can't come and like take it the same way. Like so, there are different reasons why I, I see this differently. Because you, of course, also can run into the issue is if that is you know in a in a vault somewhere. Like how, how are you going to to get it? Different provisions? Can they just pay you in fiat currencies? Uh, there's a, there's a bunch of different things in terms of uh, of storage. Um, I get very different responses whenever I talk about gold or Bitcoin for that matter, depending on where people are from. So. Uh, Born and raised in Denmark, people think it's the stupid idea idea they ever heard about, because you know stable government, slow inflation, like it doesn't make any sense for anyone. Even our our our, our central bank, you know, we have very little gold that's stored in England. Like we don't even want to touch it. People would would think you're crazy if you would buy something like that. And then you speak with you know I I had the pleasure uh, of living two years in in Asia um, here five seven years ago, and people like yeah we. We get that, especially people's parents. They were like, don't invest in equities. That's so risky, invest in gold. <laughs> like it, it had a very different perception of what is what is safe and what you can trust. Gold, that's tangible. They've experienced inflation multiple times. Yeah, we we, we get that. We understand why why that's the case. And so um, I wanted to, to transition and talk a bit more about my experience buying gold simply because I, I just, I don't know, have to tell you guys because for me, someone like me who's a very intangible person who always thought he would be buying, uh, you know, uh, shares or his brokerage accounts and never think about anything tangible. It was uh, it was a fun experience. So I've gone from knowing nothing to know a little more than nothing. Uh, but it it has been an adventure that was almost like whenever I found stocks the first time. It was really fun to to dive into. Um, so. I want to say, like, if you want to own gold, you have to make it clear to yourself uh, why you own it. It can't be quite daunting to to get started on the process, and you will probably find someone who's going to sell you like a collection of whatever. Uh, but if you want to store this as a as wealth uh, for you uh, as a small part of your portfolio, you probably want to look into unbranded uh, bullion bars. So. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is that um, gold are generally a commodity, but even so, you have branded gold bars, which I never thought I thought gold was gold. So you even have more expensive type of gold that still, if you melt it down, is worth the same, but like comes from a limited series or there's a producer who doesn't make them anymore or whatever it is. So don't go that route. Go for uh, like the, the raw gold. Um, the lower you, the quantity... Uh, you buy the higher the premium to the spot. So everyone pays a premium to the spot price, um, simply to cover the cost of the producer and for the dealer. Um, so if you buy uh, one ounce uh, coins, which is the most popular way of buying gold, um, you would typically be paying like five to eight percent premium. It really depends on the country uh, you're from, though. Uh, whereas if you buy like a kilo bar, um, which, which is uh, two point two pounds, um, you would pay around two percent. For that, and uh, there's simply there's a lot of cost going into uh, making smaller pieces of gold. Um, so also think in mind, like I, I talk about bars, it's I'm, I'm not talking about the 400 ounce bars that's 12.5 kilos that you see in the movies. Um, they're going to cost you 750,000 
plus change plus the premium. So that's not really what I'm talking about. You can have bars that's like one gram or like one ounce. So I just want to clarify that if it sounds like I'm too much of a high roller, which I'm definitely not. Um, and so just keep in mind it's 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 uh, it's pretty uh, pretty efficient. Um, I found a, a dealer here in, in in Denmark that I used. It's called Tavix because it was just the cheapest option I could find. Not necessarily because there had any other reason to do that. Um, you can go internationally um, and find like cheaper price, but uh, what I quickly found, at least in my case, is that with all the duties, insurance, shipping, and all that, because it's such an efficient market, it doesn't really make any sense. Plus, there might be some type of things you haven't seen. Um, so to me, it was very clear right out of the gates. I'll probably buy it in that country where I reside. So um, I don't know if I dare throw it back over to you, uh, Harry and, and Toby. Uh, if you at, in any way think differently about gold or if I've just lost my mind here. I, I think it's a, I think it's a great idea. Stig is like a, a wealth preservation idea. It sort of answers all those questions that I had about. Well, I guess one question I had just as a just as a you know for interest, it's not really a critique. It's just you know there's this idea that Bitcoin has um, stolen some of gold's thunder because it's it's digital gold and it's um, and, and as a result, gold perhaps hasn't participated as much recently as it might have, whereas Bitcoin's had this extraordinary run. What do you, what do you think about the prospects for, for gold and Bitcoin, you know, from here on out? Do you think that that is true that Bitcoin sort of just stole a bit more popular imagination over gold? And then I guess that the, the follow on is just, you know, do, does gold, there are scenarios where gold protects you and Bitcoin doesn't. So I know you've got a little bit of both. So that sort of makes sense. Yeah, you're, you're right. I, as I said, I, I, I did strive to see if I could insult both the uh, value investing community, Bitcoin community and the uh, gold community. So um, I, I do own Bitcoin um, and, and significantly more uh, Bitcoin than, than gold. I do think that the upside of Bitcoin is so much higher. I also do think that the downside is going to be uh, different. Um, we, we're going to talk a, a bit more about the re regulation piece whenever we get to, um, to Harish pick. Um, but um, if, if I can just do that briefly, uh, I don't see a lot of problems with regulation when it comes to gold compared to Bitcoin. That's not the same as saying if you know what hits the fan, there won't be any kind of issues with gold. But I think compared to how people perceive Bitcoin, I think it would be uh, very, very different. Just the prospects for it, and that I think that they they protect you in different scenarios, right? If there's if there is some sort of communications breakdown i don't know how how well bitcoin will go but having some gold in your vault that's that's always that strategies work for a really really long period of time through history it's like thousands of years old maybe more than that many yeah. thousands of years um bitcoin's a little bit untested in that scenario right yeah and and, and can i ask you and i know we also have to get to uh to to harry's uh pick here but can i ask you toby like for you like as a hardcore value investor, uh, a better disciple of, of Buffett and Munger perhaps than, than I am, uh, would you consider holding physical gold? Is that too foreign of a thought for you? No, not at all. It's a, the, um, you know, I'm, I'm as much Graham deep value as I am Buffett sort of more franchise value somewhere in between those two guys. Yeah, I, I could see that scenario. Um, I don't hold any at the moment because I, I have all of my my money is in the two funds that I run, uh, Deep and Zig for anybody listening at home. Um, I, I've just got everything in those for the foreseeable future um, because I think you need to eat your own cooking. But yeah, I think that there would be a point where I would, in a wealth preservation type scenario, I'd be diversifying into physical gold. All right. Um, Hari, let's, uh, let's throw it over to you. Um... And I could tease you and say, are you bringing a traditional value pick? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think this session is going to be different. <laughs> we both are going off the rails, but I think it's a good segue, though, uh, from gold to my pick, Coinbase. And the way I see this is whether it's gold or Bitcoin, I think they have their source in the libertarian mindset. Um, 
a deep distrust in central authority, a distrust in custodians, and trying to uh, find a way where we can insulate ourselves from authorities controlling our fate. I think that's what gold was about all the time. I think Bitcoin was born out of that. Um, however, um, the pick I have is actually a business, which is Coinbase. And Coinbase is a leading cryptocurrency exchange. And it has positioned itself as a reliable on-ramp into the cryptocurrency space. So, um, and for people who are not familiar with exchanges, traditionally uh, exchanges, uh, fulfill the role of a marketplace, but Coinbase does more than that. Uh, it's a trading ecosystem, asset custodian, and as well as a broker. And broker is what most of us uh, might know them for. Uh, one of the things that works in their favor is obviously the network effects because exchanges are networks. So, and being one of the first movers, they have that first mover advantage. And the second thing is uh, their cryptocurrency custodianship is actually a key part of their business model. And in fact, they have around, they had around 200 billion in the first quarter of 2021 when I last looked uh, in terms of client owned uh, cryptocurrency, which is around 11 or 12% of the outstanding market capitalization of all the cryptocurrencies. And, uh, Inside of this industry where regulation is still enforced very spotily, uh, people can't trust uh, all the exchanges or all the vendors. Coinbase has positioned itself as a safe and fully compliant exchange, and hence they are able to charge a premium. And one of the things I see Coinbase as is more about um, folks who are making the shovel during the gold rush then actually the folks are looking for gold. And in fact, it is kind of a well-known uh, myth or legend that the, sh the makers of the shovels made more money than the ones looking for gold. But more than that, uh, one of the things about Coinbase is it's not about Bitcoin. In fact, 40% of Coinbase total trading volume uh, was other than Ethereum and Bitcoin. So it's a it it supports a lot of different uh, cryptocurrencies, but that's their current business model. Um, the way I see Coinbase is as AWS or a uh, infrastructure um, for Web three point oh, rather than just a exchange for Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency. That is their current business model where they derive a lot of their revenue from, but they're rapidly expanding into other areas. And that has always been their uh, vision. Um, their CEO, Brian Armstrong, which I have been following for a while, um, has been looking into expanding into adjacent opportunities. In fact, they have already started um, collateralized cryptocurrency loans, crypto debit cards, uh, blockchain infrastructure, data analysis uh, uh, services. They have also started, uh, they're going to be starting the NFT marketplace. And they recently also um, announced a partnership with Facebook. Uh, to build a digital wallet so that people can send money internationally because Facebook couldn't uh, get Libra off the ground, but now they're partnering with uh, Coinbase and they also have a partnership with NFL that was announced. And then they have Coinbase Ventures that has multiple investments in cutting edge technologies. In fact, like earn.com was one of those acquisitions through Coinbase Ventures. Uh, in fact, Balaji Srinivasan, who's a famous angel investor, became CTO of Coinbase for a while. So that's the optionality uh, you're looking at, which is not reflected in the price today. In fact, if you look at their valuations, uh, 
price to sales uh they're selling at a much deep discount than other similar high growth or high flying companies which already have taken a fall but even after that fall companies like docusign zoom snowflake they sell at a much higher price to sales even though they have negative eps whereas coinbase has a healthy $11.75 eps a uh, good cash flow of around 9 10 billion dollars um whereas snowflake has 4 million dollars in cash flow and docusign has 400 million dollars in cash flow um and their price to earning is close to 20 which is kind of a standard run of the mill uh p for most tech companies in fact google is 27 um there are other companies who are in hundreds um tesla is 358 for example um so and then if you look at their growth and it's uh, granted that they have been public for a short while but according to their s3 they started with a half a billion in revenue and today they are close to 6 billion in revenue in last two years so there are they're growing at a quite fast pace no guarantees uh but based on the vision the ceo has his commitment and also the the areas that they are trying to expand into and also their first mover advantage i believe this is a company to watch um uh, i do believe that they're fairly valued for their current business model today but what you're getting for free is the optionality but again that's the uncertainty <laughs> we don't know whether that will pan out and that's the reason they are priced i think they they took a fall um uh, the other uncertainty is ob- obviously regulation risks and 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 one of the things that i want to highlight is the reason i was uh, watching them and not pitching them so far is i wanted that 6 months after the ipo to expire and see how the stock sells off obviously it has obvious insiders will sell a lot of employees will cash out so it has fallen from its previous peak quite a bit uh it's still fairly valued i wouldn't say it is cheap or in deep value territory from their current business model perspective but what i'm looking at is their future and uh some of the areas that they can expand into we might and this this is more like a 5 to 10 year term bet not a short term bet and if if crypto i wouldn't even call it crypto i would call it web 3.0 it's not about block bitcoin or any ethereum it's about uh web 3.0 which is metaverse is another popular term used nowadays but essentially a distributed computing model a distributed ledger model uh dapps which is distributed applications uh and dao which is um uh, distributed autonomous organizations these are the future trends and coinbase is a safe way to bet on them while you have some downside protection with their existing business model that's my thesis uh for coinbase and with that i I'm ready to be pounded <laughs> by both of you. <laughs> I I got to say I was ready to really hate this pick. But uh while you're talking I was just having a look at the um the financials. It's not nearly as expensive as I thought it was going to be. It's it's actually it's a it's a great looking business with extraordinary growth rates. And then as you as you point out the it's it's um it's expensive to fairly valued but it's not un, it's not um out of the world for it's i mean it's i fairly valued i think is right but i i shouldn't have said expensive i think it's fairly valued but it's it's not um egregiously valued it's for the for what you're getting i think it's probably as you say close to fair value for one of those things that if you if you're if you had a very long term view and you're prepared to buy it a little bit cheaper if it ever got a little bit cheaper then you, you could probably put some on and buy it as you went along because it looks like what, what what's the what's the competition like in in a space like this Harry if you if you become the the exchange 
you just sort of run away with the whole market? Is, and is that likely to happen for something like this? That's a very good question, uh, Toby. And uh, in case of Coinbase, they're actually not the leading exchange. There is Binance and others. Um, Coinbase would rank third or fourth. And uh, there, I, I think the way this space is evolving is um, Coinbase is focusing more on institutional investors, US-centric retail investors. Uh, whereas Binance has focused on other set of uh, 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 customers, basically. So each one of them are carving out their own space. So, but you are right. Eventually, you'll end up with a couple of them, or uh, not more than five or six of them, uh, who can operate at scale. That might be one outcome eventually. But right now, it is still the wild west. So there are a lot of players as of now. The growth rate is extraordinary. That's kind of an eye-popping rate of growth. It's amazing. So um, I, I'm, a, I'm a customer of, uh, of Coinbase. And so far, uh, very happy uh, with that. Um, and, and you're right. Just um, looking at it, I was actually a bit surprised uh, too. Just like Toby, whenever I, I saw it, I thought like the, the multiples would probably be outrageous. Like, 80 or whatever i wasn't even sure if the company made any money but they they do it like uh, gross margins like high 80s uh um, trailing 12 months operating margin 40 percent. like that's, that's pretty decent for, for a company doing like 10x over the past past two years on the top line uh, most of the trading volume uh 71 percent uh that's uh institutional but they actually make the money on um retail clients at least for now I don't think that Coinbase has a wide mode, um, but I do think that perhaps what goes a little under the radar is how compliant they are with all the rules. Uh, and I think that's going to be extremely important in the field we're going in. Um, it's a little too complicated to me to decipher what's going to happen with the regulation piece. Um, we, do, we, we do see that there's a lot of lobbyism going on uh, right now. Uh, both in Europe, uh, in the States, and I'm sure other places. Um, I, I, I saw a, uh, I saw a stat um, and, uh, from The Economist. I might misquote this, but um, it was there were like equivalent of one full-time lobbyist last year and 86 this year, and there were 57 uh, in Brussels, which is basically the capital of Europe in terms of regulation. So, you know, I, I do think, you know, that's a, that's a quote-unquote win uh, for uh, the crypto space. And so, um, so, so there, there are a few different thoughts into that because they would need to have the re regulations with them eventually. Um, it's probably not going to be that short term, and I don't think it's going to be as easy as a lot of people would make it out to be. Now, one of the things I found a bit ironic in the in the crypto space is that you have you have so many people who believe that governments are just evil, uh, but at the same time do not. Um, and perhaps they are, who knows? But at the same time, they're like, and yes, but they will also welcome Bitcoin as the new wealth preserved currency. And you're like, well, if they were so evil, they probably wouldn't give out like the control of money, which is you know, one of the reasons why they have power in the first place. Th those two arguments have just always seemed a bit, bit, bit counterintuitive. And, and I think it's so important to understand this. You know, I, I hear a lot of arguments about, you know, we closed mining down in, in or they closed mining down in China or like, even that it just shows how how strong crypto is, and I don't know if I necessarily agree with those arguments. Um, I, I do see the price of Bitcoin, and and you know I that's also my second biggest asset allocation. So I I'm definitely talking against my own position when I'm saying this. But I do think a lot of people underestimate uh, how important the regulation piece is, and most people choose to ignore it simply because it's too complicated to figure out what to what to do with. Um, Regulators can make it extremely, extremely hard for you to hold crypto. What are you going to do if it's um, if you'll be fine to hold it, or if you'll go to prison if you do it? Well, a lot of people would say, "Well, I can still run my own node in my basement. The government will never find out." It's like, yes, true. I grant that it can't. It can't be leave the surface of the planet. That's not what I'm saying. But if you're if you're saying to all institutions they cannot hold it and they need to disclose it and to pay tech dollars what they do 
it is a problem. And you know, you might be a hardcore bit Bitcoin fan who would say, I will never let go of my Bitcoin. I get that. Great point. But like the 95 or 99% of the people, that would just be like, it's just it's just too hard. Can I just watch Netflix? I'm not I I don't want that fight. It's okay. I can still go to Starbucks and pay with, with my dollar. So um, that statement is probably going to make me very unpopular uh, in the Bitcoin um, community. Uh, so that's sort of like what I see uh, if I could call with some kind of projection over the next five, 10, 10 years or whatnot. At the same time, I think there is a longer running trend that are very important uh, for crypto. And uh, I know it, that whenever you talk about um, um, Coinbase specifically hard, you're also talking about Web uh, 3.0 and and but whereas I'm perhaps a bit more talking specifically about crypto and cryptocurrencies. Uh, but I, I wanted to bring up this this quote. This is an amazing quote by uh, Max Planck, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1918. And he talks about how science advances one funeral at a time. So um, he has this quote like, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up and is familiar with it. All right, so what's the point of, of this quote? Well, uh, you have a major wealth transfer going on here uh, right now in the time to come where you have the boomers uh, going going out of the market, some of them uh, pass away, and then you have millennials who have grown up with everything being digital. And I think that longer term trend is really, really important. So those millennials are not the regulators right now, but they eventually will be. So I do think that's a plus long term. Short term, I think there's going to be a lot more pain compared to uh, what you what you might expect. And the lobbyism um, in the crypto space is just, it's a lot bigger now than it was, but it's going from nothing to very little over nothing right now. Um, like if you compare it to the lobbyism for, you know, defense or uh, tobacco, oil and gas, like it, it can't even be be compared. It would take, take, take many years. So, um, so what do I think about Coinbase? Wow, I kind of fell out with that detail here. Uh, Coinbase to me makes a lot of sense whenever I look at the numbers. Um, it, for the time being, it's probably a bit too much in the too hot pile. I do think that they have a bit more mode than from the regulation standpoint than some of the other exchanges uh, in that space. It's also one of those where I'm like, it's too hard to figure out who the winner is, even though that there's probably going to be a major, major growth. Uh, for the industry as such. So that was my way, very long winded way of saying, I don't know. Uh, so let me let me send it back to you, Ari. No, I think these are really good points. And uh, as you brought up uh, stake, I think regulation is a tail risk that all these companies will face. But I think Coinbase is one of the diversified players. They are not really depending upon Bitcoin or any specific cryptocurrency for that matter. In fact, I'm more excited about uh, their NFT marketplace. And if you look at the gaming industry today, uh, it's around $180 billion. Uh, and it's expected to be like $250, $300 billion by 2025. And a lot of those, and I don't have the stats um, ready uh, on my hand now, but a significant percentage of those players actually buy virtual goods it might be skins or uh, stuff like that online on these games and that's where the nft uh, is making its uh, way into and that can be a huge marketplace uh, in the future so uh, yeah it's kind of borderline venture investing that way because uh, when I say this, I'm looking at Toby. It's like I have no way to kind of, you know, provide any uh, uh, data to back what's going to be the prospects. And that's why I think the way I'm I'm looking at it is I would value them as an exchange today with an optionality of all these new ventures that they're having. But if I'm getting the exchange at a fair value or a little bit above the fair value, then my downside risk is protected because I get the optionality for free. But what I have not covered, as you mentioned, Stick, is in my thesis or in my evaluation is the downside risk of regulation, 
it's almost like a binary there uh based on what i have seen in fact coinbase is one of the players in the forefront in terms of regulation they are one of the regulatory friendly companies they have a foundation that advocates for cryptocurrencies in general they have uh, uh former uh, justices on their uh, or folks from doj on their board so they are pretty much um well connected to the washington political circles in that sense uh and that gives them the advantage of working with the regulators but it's they are just not doing for themselves it's more for the industry so they are doing their part to reduce the tail risk and there is a lot of money in fact a lot of politicians are now invested in cryptocurrencies too uh and i was recently looking at a tweet um uh, i don't know whether toby you saw that uh a lot of our congressmen and women have actually beaten the snp <laughs> in the last one or two years did you see that stat <laughs> so uh, yeah i did yeah <laughs> i think our politicians are great investors we don't just give them the credit <laughs> nancy pelosi <laughs> is world class she's the next buffett <laughs> so um uh, i'm pretty sure a lot of them have bought into bitcoin as well um but i think that's not the point i think coinbase is not dependent on bitcoin's future it's a on ramp and a infrastructure play on uh web 3.0 is how i see it uh so it's a diversified player but as you said like you know it's it has downsides for sure and uh, and i think that is the uncertainty which is being to some extent priced into the stock price today but whether all the risk has been priced or not is something that i am not sure so yeah that but great question i think you made me think so thank you both of you and i guess if i can just add one thing hari i would say that whenever it comes to to store of wealth i think that you have to think about regulation slightly differently because you need the you need the institutions there um individuals cannot pump the market cap up to those of say gold that's you know 12 trillion bitcoin is hovering under um a billion i guess the entire market cap of of crypto might be what 2.5 or something like that so i think it's important to have that like that piece of store wealth whereas some of the other initiatives that doing that they're a lot more uh, catered to uh individuals and uh they won't face the same type of of scrutiny because it's not as sensitive as you know talking about money um so toby i'm 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 curious to hear like now a a value investor a true value investor having been through this horrible experience uh talking about both gold and and bitcoin um any thoughts here before we uh we end the uh the show no i i think this is a good diversified portfolio we've got gold coinbase uh and a good growthy <laughs> stock and a and a deep value stock this this portfolio whatever happens it's going to do well and badly <laughs> all right jens uh thank you as always so much for taking the time to uh to join the show you know we we're doing this once a quarter we have done that for many many years now I hope we can continue doing it it's it's always so much fun to to have the chance to uh, to to speak with you guys and have you as a, a sounding board so um hari why don't we uh, uh hari i would like to give you the opportunity to uh tell people a bit more about yourself where can they find you how can they uh, interact with you Awesome. Yeah. Uh, thank you again Stegan. I have enjoyed uh joining the show for many years with you and Toby. Uh, everyone can find me on my blog bitsbusiness.com or my Twitter handle is hari rama h a r a r a m a. Uh, I'm happy to join the conversation and know everybody's feedback and thoughts. All right, Toby. Where can uh, people learn more about you? I run a firm called Acquirers Funds. We manage two ETFs, uh the Acquirers Fund, which the ticker is ZIG, which is a mid-cap, large-cap domestic US uh value quality fund. Um and I run another one called Deep, uh which is a small cap, micro cap version of the same thing. And I'm on uh I have a little website called acquirersmultiple.com where you can get free it's a free screen. that sort of follows the same rules um 
and I ha- I'm on Twitter at Greenbacked, G R E E N B A C K D. Fantastic. All right. We'll, uh, we'll make sure to, of course, link to all of it. Okay. Uh, Toby, Hari, again, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, uh, to join us here on the Investors Podcast. I really Thanks. appreciate it. Thanks, Stig. That was fun. Thanks, Harry. Thank you, guys. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 